Let's continue our worship with our affirmation of faith for the morning. It is the Apostles' Creed as printed in your bulletin. Let's recite this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship at St. Luke's. We are so happy that you are joining with us today, whether you're in person or online for this holiday weekend as we worship God together. Today we are especially mindful of and want to celebrate first and always the freedom, the ultimate freedom that we have in relationship with Jesus Christ and we want to celebrate and give thanks for those who have given of themselves and continue to give of themselves so that we can live in the freedoms we enjoy in this country. So I hope you are taking time to celebrate both this holiday weekend. We have several ways happening in July that we can share life together as a church family, and so I want to draw your attention to two today. The first is a study on the celebration of discipline, which sounds like kind of an ominous title, but it's really a fantastic and transformative study about the spiritual disciplines and how we can incorporate them into our everyday lives and grow in our faith. So if that sounds like something that you would be interested in or you know somebody who would, we invite you to join Join Katie Brown as she facilitates that study for us beginning on Sunday afternoons next Sunday. Also want to lift up some family fun. On Friday, July 14, in our branches building, we will be watching a movie together and serving popcorn and having a picnic all inside, don't worry, We're in, the, in the nice air conditioning. And so if you have a neighbor or a friend that you're thinking of that would really enjoy getting to be a part of this event, um, please bring them and enjoy that time um, in the summer together on July 14. Now as we continue to worship the Lord our God together, let's hear the reading of God's word for us today. Good morning. Good morning. Hear the word of the Lord from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or unpure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
And now together, let us quiet our minds and open our hearts as we pray. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our prayer of grateful praise. Praise for this new day and praise for this sanctuary where we can safely gather together in love. This morning here, we remember all the gifts that we have received. The gift of family and friends who reached out to us the gift of opportunities to share our blessings and care for those in need, and the gift of an unexpected smile or wave from a neighbor or a friend or a stranger. Yes, so many gifts. In our journey of life, new every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long, you are working for good in the world. Stir up in us desire to serve you and to live peacefully with our neighbor and to devote each day to your son, our savior, Jesus the Christ, who teaches us to pray, our father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers to begin to make their way forward at this time as we continue with our offering. And as they do, and as the plate goes by you, if you're in person or as you meditate online, I invite you to consider all the ways that God is inviting you to offer your very best, every aspect of your life. Maybe that looks like finances. Maybe that looks like prayers. Maybe it looks like being present with someone this week. In all these ways, meditate on how God is inviting you to give, to offer your whole life as we hear from our wonderful staff ensemble.
Please stand. In case you are joining us for the first time or you need a refresher, we are in the middle of a series of road trips with Paul. We've been traveling with him as he visits and writes letters to newly forming Christian communities in order to teach, encourage, and challenge them to allow the gospel to really shape every aspect of their lives. So as we roll down the windows on this road trip, I hope the fresh wind of God's spirit will help us not only better understand what life was like for these early Christians, but that we will find some new passion and clarity on what it means to live out our faith too. Let's pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Today we are picking up with Paul on his second road trip or missionary journey. He's taken the exit for Corinth and has decided to stay for a while. In between making new friends, shout out to Priscilla and Aquila, and setting up his pop-up shop to sell the tents he makes, I think REI better watch out, Paul starts writing this letter to the Christian community in Thessalonica. Thessalonica was prime real estate for the Mediterranean world of that day because it was right on the Via Ignatia, which was the major land route between east and west, the perfect positioning for anybody and everybody trying to make a living. The people of Thessalonica were predominantly Greeks, although there was a steady flow of immigrants coming in from all over the world to make Thessalonica their new home. So the city was really becoming a mashup of cultures, languages, philosophies, and food. Paul and his friends, Silas and Timothy, had road tripped to Thessalonica recently, and Acts chapter 17 tells us a little bit about their experiences there about how the Christian community started when a handful of Jews, quite a few God-fearing Greeks, and some predominant women leaders in the city got together. But at some point, some of the Jewish community grew jealous of the traction that these young Christians were getting, so much so that they ended up whipping up a mob who dragged some of these Christians before the city leaders, shouting accusingly, these people are turning the world upside down. Wow. There's something about the message of the gospel and the way these early Christians are sharing it that is turning the world upside down. This is no polite, contained, culturally acceptable way to spend a Sunday morning. This is shocking. It is transforming the very fabric of society, the very order of the world. And some people find this inspiring, while others find it threatening. Soon after that, Paul and his friends continue on their road trip in order to plant more churches and encourage more Christians throughout Europe and the Mediterranean world. But Paul could not forget this community in Thessalonica. So when he heard that they were struggling with people in the city trying to distract, disunify, and discourage them, 
he thought it was time to write them a letter in order to remind them what it really means to be the church, to embody the gospel. To embody the gospel. Gospel is such a churchy word, isn't it? We say it a lot, don't we? But what do we really mean by it? Well, the Greeks meant by the word gospel a description of news shared in victory. A messenger would come, face shining, spear decked with laurel, head crowned, swinging palm branches wildly, shouting for the whole city to hear that the battle was over, they had won. The rabbinic Jews used the word gospel to refer to the message that plays like variations on a musical theme. Throughout the part of the scriptural story we refer to as the Old Testament. The message about how the one true God created us in God's image. How God gave us free will to choose whether to be relationship with God, but wanted nothing more than for us to be in that relationship, that covenant relationship, and would stop at nothing to make it possible and lasting. In the New Testament, the word gospel is used with a new meaning, a new layer of meaning. It's used to describe the good news that Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, teaches and embodies in his being. The gospel in the New Testament is proclaimed by missionaries and musicians, by financiers and fishermen, by angels and thieves, by pregnant women and the poor. The gospel we learn from Jesus is for all people. It is everywhere at work. It gives new life. It heals. It restores trust. It offers connection, relationship, belonging. It brings hope. It rescues, liberates, and sets things right. It is entirely unique. It feels like a tight embrace and an extravagant welcome home after a long time away. It smells like a newborn lying in a feeding trough. It tastes like fresh baked bread. It sounds like the calm after a storm. It looks like a group of tenacious toddlers clamoring to climb into Jesus' lap. The gospel is good news that is meant to infuse every fiber of our being to resound to the depths of our souls. The gospel is Jesus Christ, God with us, in it all, for us all, for love of us all. That's the gospel. As Paul writes to the Thessalonians in our passage today, he reminds them and us how to share it. We share the gospel, Paul says in verse 2, with courage in God. In God. That part of the phrase I think is critical because Paul is not trying to offer a pop culture reference to the Wizard of Oz, nor is he trying to give us a TED Talk to take in on our drive to work. This is something unique here. Paul is reminding us where our courage comes from and what, or rather who, it is rooted in, come what may, every day in every context. For Christians in parts of the world for the past 2,000 years who have battled intense persecution for their faith, courage in God may look a certain way. And for us who are living in America, for us who are living in Texas today, it may look a little different. Courage in God may look like a willingness to remain non-defensive when criticized by core truths. 
It may look like a willingness to listen with a gracious and generous spirit with those whom we disagree. It may look like a tenacity in advocating for those who do not have a voice. It may look like a willingness to work alongside people who are new to us or different than us. We share the gospel with courage in God. We share the gospel from a motivation to please God, Paul says in verse 4. But what does that mean? How do we please God? Well, when Jesus was baptized, you may remember there was a voice from heaven. And that voice said, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Before he did any miracles. Before he taught parables before he calmed storms or fed thousands, before he healed the sick and restored people to community, before he forgave sins or went to the cross, God called Jesus beloved. God said to Jesus, I am well pleased with you. Jesus' very being is what was pleasing to God. And the same is true for me and you. God is pleased with you, not for what you do, but for who you are. And so our motivation to share the gospel comes out of a, a desire to live out of this pleasure we bring God just for our very being. And a desire that everyone will come to experience this identity and worth as God's beloved people. We share the gospel with integrity, an integrity that comes as we allow God to keep working in us every day. Paul refers to that in verses four and five in terms of God testing our hearts and God being a witness to Paul's motives. In the 1500s, St. Ignatius of Loyola developed an intentional way of making space for us to bring ourselves before this examining work God can do within us. We sometimes call it the daily examen. Maybe you've heard of it before, maybe not. The basic idea is that at the end of each day, we carve out a little bit of time to sit before God honestly and to review our day. And as we do that, we thank God for the good moments and we ask God for help to recognize the moments that were hard, painful, confusing, or where we were just plain wrong. And as we become aware of that, we ask for God's help to work with us on the stuff that was hard and confusing. We ask for God's healing for those painful moments. We ask for God's forgiveness and grace for all the moments we sinned and fell short. And we ask for God's wisdom to make different choices tomorrow. No matter how little or how long we've been in relationship with Christ, we are in daily need of this rhythm of confession, repentance, and receiving of God's forgiveness, love, and grace. Practices like the daily examine keep us humble and keep us truly aware that as we share the gospel, we're doing so on the same playing field as everyone else. We are all sinners in need of a savior. And the integrity that we have plays an important part in whether people will believe the gospel that we are sharing is real and whether they'll believe that it really is good news. We share the gospel in relationship. Paul says it this way in verse 7. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. We cared for you. Right here, Paul employs a very rare Greek word, 
to describe a kind of caring that comes from an intense longing, a feeling of being drawn to something or someone. This imagery that Paul is using here offers us some insight into the tenderness and the vulnerability that's involved when we share the gospel in relationship. This tenderness is not coercive, but it comes alongside. It's not manipulative. It's invitational. It's not judgmental. It's compassionate. And this this vulnerability is what enables us to be real about the ways that we are stumbling and growing in our journey of life and faith. Well, in case this metaphor of a nursing mother is not relatable for some of us, or we've simply rushed on past it, Paul tries again to get his point across in verse 8 with slightly different words. He says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Friends, when we tap into this, we are tapping into the heart of our God, who, out of a deep caring that intensely longs for us and is drawn to us, sent Jesus, his only son, to be Emmanuel, God with us through it all. We make that sound general sometimes, I think. But really, Jesus shared life in very concrete ways, like around the dinner table and at a wedding reception, by a graveside and a well on the beach, and in the mountains. He taught us about God's kingdom by telling stories. He engaged people in conversation wherever they were, on hikes and fishing trips, snack breaks, and in the middle of a work day, and at the edge of a desperation. He listened to and he shared everything from anxiety to joy, grief to healing, Doubt to faith, ostracization to belonging. When one of the religious leaders asked Jesus what the most important commandment is, you may remember how Jesus answered. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Apparently, the way that we love God, ourselves, and our neighbors involves every aspect of ourselves, every part of our lives. So just as God is with us in every moment of our lives, so God invites us to share life with people in ways that point them to how God is present with them in every moment of their lives too. That call then is to show up on the ball field and in the hospital room, in the pickleball court and in the courtroom, at the dinner table and in the carpool line, in the online gaming platform and at the HOA meeting, in the struggle with infertility and in the grappling with getting older, in the struggle with loneliness and in the wrestling with codependency, in the never-ending cycle of meal prepping, planning, and cooking, and in the struggle with trying to manage chronic pain, on the playground and in the nursing home, in person and via text message. There is a line in one of our United Methodist liturgies for baptism in which the parents or guardians of children or those who are unable to answer for themselves vow that they will, quote, live a life that reveals the gospel. Live a life that reveals the gospel. I am a Christian in part, or I became a Christian in part, because there were people in my life who shared life with me in ways that revealed the gospel. 
in ways that made it real, personal, and transformative. I continue to be a Christian today. I continue to be a part of the church today in part because there are people around me who are sharing life with me in ways that keep reminding, inspiring, and challenging me to come back, to come back to the God who calls me beloved, who longs to share every part of life with me. The God who wants and invites me to share life with those who have never heard and those who have forgotten. Those who have been turned off from the faith by hypocrisy and those who are looking for a long obedience in the same direction. Those who have longed for a safe space to ask the honest questions and those battling every day with anxiety and depression. Those who feel worthless, unseen, or unheard. Those who feel like they don't deserve love. Those who are struggling to get through today, and those who are already rushing ahead to next week's plans. Those who are going through the motions of faith out of obligation, and those unsure how to live in the tension of doubt and faith. Those who are just too busy to think, and those who think the gospel isn't true. In verse four, Paul reminds us that God has entrusted, entrusted the gospel to us. And so with courage in our God, with a motivation to live out of God's pleasure in our very being, allowing God to continually work within us with the tenderness and vulnerability and relationship, we will share the gospel, the grounding of our faith, the expression of our hope, the source of our joy, the good news that God is always with us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for reminding us what the gospel is all about and for inviting, really challenging us to share this good news by sharing life with those around us. We are in awe that you would trust us with this incredible privilege. Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear your presence with us in every moment. And fill us, Spirit, with your unique blend of empowerment through courage, accountability, tenderness, and vulnerability so that we will live lives that reveal the gospel. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. This morning, as you are able, I invite you to join us as we stand and sing together our hymn of commitment, number 696, America the Beautiful.
Christians, I know you are excited to hear that next week Tom Pace will be back from his vacation. And so we are so looking forward to getting to hear from him as we continue in our road trips with Paul. Now please receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace as you live a life that reveals the gospel. Amen.